Choosing the right programming language has been something that beginners and Stack Overflow elitists have debated for years. And let's be honest, there are literally thousands of languages to choose from, which makes the conversation even more confusing. From high-level languages that are easier for humans to read, like Python or Java, to low-level languages like C or Assembly that provide more control over hardware. Every language has its strengths and weaknesses, unless you're PHP. It's just mostly weaknesses. But I think when people ask this question, especially when it comes to game development, what they're really saying is, what programming language is easy to pick up and start learning? Can I make a commercial product with it? Or could I use this language to eventually get a job? So today I'm gonna partially answer those questions by making the same game using three popular programming languages. I'll tell you which ones I like or dislike, their differences, and which ones I recommend. Now when deciding what sort of game I should make for this video, I kept going back and forth. I wanted to make it simple enough for beginners while showing a variety of different systems. I ended up deciding on making a Flappy Bird clone, partially because it fits the criteria I just mentioned and also because I've never done it before and it just sounded fun. So once I was set on Flappy Bird and after I played a couple rounds of it, it had been a while, I quickly designed the artwork and then finally jumped into Sublime Text to start programming. For our first language, I decided on Python. It's an interpreted, object-oriented, high-level programming language with dynamic semantics that's just disgusting sounding. So to put it Simply, it's just easy for humans to use and understand. You don't need to compile it before running, and you can change things on the fly while the program is still running. So. There you go. In 2024, it was rated the most popular programming language and it's projected to be so again in 2025. As for the framework I'll be using, I decided to stick with Pygame. I used it in my last Python video and I really enjoyed it. The documentation is really solid and it's just, it's pretty intuitive. So I started off by importing Pygame and setting up the window rendering. After that, I was eager to add my little snake character I designed based off the Python logo. Though now that I'm looking at it, it kind of looks like an S. Either way, I created a player class, defined a few variables, and then loaded in the player sprites. After that, I created an update function that applied some gravity to the player by adding an increasing velocity to the player's Y coordinate. I then made the player jump by creating a function that sets the player's velocity to negative 10 when the spacebar is pressed. Next, I loaded in the background sprite and animated it by changing the background's X position. When the image goes off the screen, I just reset the position to make the loop endless. And to prevent you from seeing that blue color while the image is moving, I just draw the background a second time at an offset so it looks seamless. I then drew the ground tile using the same method but at a different speed to create some parallax. After that it was time to make the pipes so I create a new class and yes for a third time applied the same logic as the background to make the pipes move to the left. This time around though I randomized the height of the pipes each time they reset so they're in a different spot. At this point all that was left to do was add the collisions, the score, and the sounds so I started with collisions first. First I detect if the player's Y was too high meaning like you're off the screen or too low meaning that you're touching the ground. If so it resets the player and pipe positions back to where they were, essentially just restarting the game. Adding collisions to the pipes were a little bit more tricky. I had to use an access aligned bounding box, also known as AABB collision detection. I know that's a mouthful. I won't go into full depth here of how it works, but essentially it just checks if two rectangles are overlapping. So that's that's about it. For the score, I created a score variable and drew it to the screen with a custom font. I then just detected if the player's X was greater than the pipes. And if so, then the player gets a point. It's pretty straightforward. Lastly, I loaded in some sound effects to play when the player jumps, scores, or gets hurt, and then I just froze the player and the pipes from moving until you press a key to start the game. And that's about it. That's the first game. Overall, Python was really easy to pick up and start using. Some of the object-oriented parts, like defining a class, are a little confusing, especially if you're just a beginner. But if you want to learn a language that's easy to use or potentially could get you a job in the future, or if you use Python for your job at work and are just interested in game development, then I would definitely check it out. But with that said, it's time for our next language, and that is Lua. It's a small but powerful language that runs fast, doesn't use a whole lot of memory, and can be added into other programs to help control them. It has increased in popularity over the last couple of years due to how easy it is to learn, and also because platforms like Roblox use it, which allow you to create games with. One of the most popular frameworks for Lua, and the one that I'll be using today, is called Love2D. It's been used to create popular games like Baltro, Gravity Circuit, and Moonshire, which is currently being developed by my friend and fellow game developer, Chalicade. But enough talking, it's time to start coding. Now the process for coding the game in Lua versus Python were extremely similar. And instead of taking you step by step like I did last time, we'll just talk about the main highlights. And since I already had the logic for the Python version, recreating it in Lua went pretty smoothly. I did have to fix one little bug for Love2D to work. I had to update my environment variables on Windows, but after that, I hit the ground running. 
I was quickly able to draw the player, add gravity, and jumping right off the bat. And this time around, I wasn't an absolute monster, and I actually separated the player and pipe objects into separate scripts. This is also a little thing, but I changed the character artwork, making it look like a heart based off of Love 2D's logo, and I also swapped out the colors to feel like a nice sunset. Next, I got to work adding and animating the background again. I also forgot how similar the syntax for Lua and Python truly are. The biggest difference that I came across were like function was called function instead of def, like in Python. Also, you have to use the words then and and for an if statement instead of just using a colon. Anywho, I drew the pipes, added collisions, and last but not least, added in these sound effects. I don't know why, they, but they were a lot louder this time. And with all that, we made Flappy Bird again. Overall, I thought Lua and Love2D were amazing. It was super intuitive and even more user-friendly for beginners. I could definitely see myself using it to make a larger game down the road. I feel like if you're an absolute beginner who wants to start learning object-oriented programming, or you want to make a commercial game without an engine, you'll definitely want to check it out. But now it's time for our final language, and that's JavaScript. JavaScript is a weird programming language because it's used to make websites interactable. It runs directly in your browser and works alongside HTML and CSS. Basically, HTML is like the structure of your website, CSS is the style of it, and finally, JavaScript just controls the behaviors of it. Regarding game development, it's mostly used for creating web-based or mobile games, but it's even been used to create popular games such as the action RPG CrossCode using a custom HTML5 engine. Also, that game has a killer soundtrack, by the way. With that said, instead of using a popular framework like Phaser or Babylon.js, we're just gonna use a regular their old HTML canvas and code this game vanilla style. So first off, I started by creating a simple HTML web page. All this does really is just link to a CSS file, which is where I'm loading in my custom font for the score. It also links to a JavaScript file, which is where all the real coding is ha gonna happen. And finally, I just created a canvas called board inside of the body of my HTML. And that's it. Outside of that, everything is pretty much the same process as the last two languages. I once again redesigned the character's art and swapped out the background colors and then I added them into the game. I will say I quickly ran into issues of forgetting to add parentheses, brackets, and semicolons to like everything. Unlike Python, which is indentation sensitive, in JavaScript you have to wrap your functions and if statements with brackets. I don't know why I'm acting like this is like such a strange thing because most programming languages use this like C Sharp and Java, but it's just jarring after you've been using Lua and Python. After that, I repeat the same routine of adding in the player with gravity and jumping, the background and ground animation, score with a custom font, and lastly, the pipes. Now, when it came to adding in the AABB collisions, I had a strange error where my player would just randomly start resetting, or like some of the pipes just wouldn't hurt him. And after using some green boxes to draw out what was happening, I realized that only the player's artwork was moving and not the collision box. Lastly, I added in the sounds, which for some reason are like even louder this time around. I'm not sure what's happening there. And that was it. The game was finished. Overall, JavaScript with an HTML canvas was way easier than I thought it was going to be. At first I was confused because I didn't know how to debug when I got errors, but then I just realized you just need to right click and, and spec the page. Like, I know, that's common sense, right? I could see myself using this to create a cool little game for my personal website, and I would definitely recommend this to web developers who want to get into game development. But when it comes to making commercial games for consoles or Steam, I still personally would lean towards using Lua or Python, as JavaScript definitely feels like it was built more for the web, which it was. Either way, each of these languages have a lot to offer, and I was honestly surprised how much I enjoyed using all of them. At the end of the day, languages and game engines for the most part, really aren't that important. If you wanna mess around with my sloppy source code, I'll have a link to it in the description below. And if you wanna start programming and you don't know where to start, then check out a word from today's sponsor and longtime supporter of the channel, Brilliant. Brilliant is where you learn by doing, with thousands of interactive lessons in math, data, analysis, programming, and AI. And one thing I really like about it is Brilliant helps you build critical thinking skills through problem solving, not memorization. So while you're building real knowledge on specific topics, you'll also be becoming a better thinker. Not to mention that Brilliant makes it easy to learn anywhere right on your phone, with fun lessons that you can do whenever you have the time. Whether you're diving into a new topic or doing a quick practice session, you can always level up on the go 
in just minutes. Brilliant's growing number of programming courses are a great way to build foundations and learn real world applications. Get familiar with Python and start building programs on day one with a built-in drag and drop editor. Learn essential coding elements from loops and variables to nesting and conditionals. And most importantly, develop your mind to think like a programmer and begin to write complex programs to build games and applications. I mean, hey, yep, you got me on games. With that said, if you don't know where to start, Brilliant is a great start. And to try everything Brilliant has to offer for free for a full 30 days, visit brilliant.org slash goodgifts or scan the QR code on screen, or you can just click the link in the description. There's, there's plenty of ways, people. You'll also get 20% off an annual premium subscription, so check it out. Anywho, that's it for today's video. If you want to see more videos in this series, please let me know. Put in the comments which languages you'd like me to compare. And if you like this video, make sure to like and subscribe. And also, check out my website. Uh, it's it's uh, pretty cool. I'll see you next time. Peace.